Well, hello, everybody. Welcome this evening. It's good to see everybody. So welcome to the North Andover Historical Society, Stephen Centers on the Common, and the Warden Theater. We are so glad you joined us this evening. This is a combined uh, program um, between the Harvard Club of Boston and, um, and the North Andover Historical Society. So we're excited everybody is here. Um, I'm Lynn Wenzel, and I am the, books, the volunteer bookstore manager at the Historical Society, and also um, with my friend Stuart Pesco. Um, we are responsible for the fall speaker series at the Historical Society. And we're in the process of setting up our programs for um, the winter and spring. So if you have any ideas, talk to me before you leave. Um, you may have noticed that there's a lot going on in this building. So please check out the 1646 bookstore for a selection of books and merchandise before you leave. There's some fun things in there for Christmas presents. Um, you also may have noticed that there's a cafe potentially going in here, and it'll be a welcoming spot for coffee and a bite to eat. And as soon as we get final permitting, that will be open. We have a couple of upcoming programs that are going to be happening in December and January. So on Saturday, December 9th, we'll have a mini holiday market and movie here. And on Tuesday, um, January 9th, Professor Jamie Wilson from Salem State um, will be talking about his book, Martin Luther King Jr., A Life in American History at 7 p.m. So we're lucky to have him the week before MLK's birthday. And please check out our website for additional programs as they're added and follow us on Facebook. And because I have to put this plug in, because no nonprofit can function without members and volunteers. If you like what we're doing and would like to be a part, there's a membership application and a volunteer sign-up sheet in the lobby. We'd love to add you to our communications and our volunteers opportunity newsletter. You can pick and choose the area of interest, which includes school programs, archives, or welcoming visitors, to name a few. Now I'm going to do my safety talk. So um, just if you would please put your cell phones and, and any other noisemakers into silent mode during the program. Please refrain from any eating or drinking in the theater other than, wa than water. Um, bathrooms are through the boardroom out there and on the right. And if you have to use the bathroom during the program, please be sure to shut the door when you're done because the fans keep going and they interrupt the speaker. Um, and in case of an emergency, the main exit is where you came in through the theater. But there's also another emergency exit to my left out there. It's right past the organ. Um, so. Again, thank you to our partner up in the balcony, Brian Frazier from North Andover Cam. We are recording this for replay on our local cable access station. And in the lobby, um, handling book sales this evening, is um, Kate Kiesling from our new bookstore in town. Bookstores are not dead, thank goodness. <laughs> So if you haven't seen her, she is over in North Andover Mall, sandwiched between Gentle Dental and a, and a salon. Um, but she will be selling um, copies of Martin's book, Culture, and he will be signing afterwards. So we're excited to have that happen. So I turn this over to Stuart, who will introduce our speaker. I hate following Lynn. <laughs> I'll do my best to sound excited. Uh, as president of the Harvard Club of Merrimack Valley and a member of the board of directors of the North Andover Historical Society, uh, I got to welcome my fellow officers and directors and members of our two organizations and all the rest of you who I hope are future members of one of those two organizations. Um, briefly, uh, Professor Martin Puckner is a professor of English at Harvard University. He's a prize-winning author and whose books range from philosophy to the arts, including best-selling The Written Word and his memoir, The Language of Thieves. As Lynn mentioned, his newest book, Culture, which just came out in the spring of 23, will be available out in the lobby, and Martin is here to sign those. Uh, one of the things we usually do at a uh, presentation that includes a Harvard speaker is give the professor's full title and list all of their books and publications and all that, and I don't want to take up too much of Martin's time with that. So let me just leave it at this. 
He's the Byron and Anita Wien Professor of Drama and of English and Comparative Literature and the founding director of the Mellon School of Theater and Performance Research at Harvard, which is a summer program, as I understand, and uh, uh, I've attended some of the uh, dramatic things going on at Harvard. I highly recommend those, too, to my fellow alumni. Uh, so what's going to happen is Martin is going to tell stories for a little while, uh, probably 35, 40 minutes, and then we will open the floor to questions. Uh, if you've got a really, really hot question that just really needs to be answered, hold it until the end, like I just said. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Martin. All right. Thank you. Oh, this is going to bear. Oh, here it is. Yeah. Well, it's a great pleasure. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to talk about stories and the importance of stories. Uh, this is material drawn from a book that came out a few years ago, The Written World, but it will also segue into some of the more recent work I've been doing, including in a kind of sequel to this book uh, called Culture that uh, I guess is available here, which is nice. Um, the topic though here is really the importance of storytelling. That's the topic we, uh, uh, I agreed to speak on. And um, I'm gonna touch on many different kinds of stories, especially some of the oldest stories we've been telling. Um, but the, with the thought, with the main point being the importance of sh stories and how they shape human, uh, our minds, uh, motivate our actions, and um, therefore have shaped history. In corresponding with Stuart uh, just today, uh, he mentioned that, of course, what's happening right now in the Middle East is in part due to conflicting stories about the same place. Uh, and, and I think that's an excellent point, and I might even touch on that. So this is just to say that stories matter, uh, um, that, that uh, we see that right now in the Middle East. And also that stories are not always benign, uh, uh, that because they have such shaping power over, over people and their imagination, they, um, they, they, are, they can be double-edged. Uh, so the, what I'm trying to do today is, in a sense, give you the big picture of storytelling, or in other words, tell you the story of stories. And it's always good to start at the beginning. Uh, in the case of storytelling, of course, it's impossible to uh, identify the beginning because humans have been telling stories from the beginning. We, we in many ways are, I think, storytelling animals. That, that is that stories, especially these foundational stories, as I call them, shape the way we view the world and, and view each other. Um, and there's not been a human society without stories uh, that's ever been recorded. But when it comes to actually being able to pinpoint some of the earliest stories, we rely on a technology, namely the technology of writing. And this is therefore how I want to start. Uh, now, writing was invented about 5,000 years ago um, in Mesopotamia, in today's Iraq. Uh, it was a technology of making incisions onto moist clay. Um, you can here see an image from the Harvard Art Museum of a small handheld device uh, about the size of a cell phone uh, that bears, it's, a, it's actually a clay envelope uh, uh, with a clay letter with, within it in cuneiform writing. Now, under what, what, why was this technology invented? It's hard to pinpoint because it's about 5,000 years ago, uh, but fortunately the earliest scribes, the earliest people who knew how to write down words told a story and wrote down a story about the invention of writing. Uh, it's a funny story. It involves a king, a king of Uruk, a city in southern Iraq. Uh, and this king is trying to expand the, the, the influence of the city-state uh, into the mountains, into the mountains of Arata. And so he sends a messenger to the king of Arata and threatens the king of Arata with invasion uh, unless the king of Arata uh, uh, pledge allegiance to, to, to the city of Uruk. Uh, the king of Arata is not very impressed by this threat and sends the messenger back to Uruk. And back and forth, the messenger now runs at, at the moment of this sort of diplomatic impasse. And the king of Uruk is gonna, becomes more and more extreme in his threats. Uh, he really wants 
the mountain world of Arata. And at, at some point when the messenger returns one more time uh, with a negative uh, response, the king of Ur gets so angry that he utters this long rant. And the messenger standing next to him, according to the story, panics because he can't remember all the words. He can't remember the long rant. And it's at this moment in, in the story that the, that the king of Arata, this angry king of Arata, who really wants to convince this mountain lord of, uh, no, sorry, the king of Uruk, who wants to convince the mountain lord of Arata to, to pledge allegiance to him, takes some clay from the ground. And in, 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 in Mesopotamia, the ground is full of clay flattens it into a tablet like this, uh, puts his words onto the tablet, gives the tablet to the messenger, sends the messenger one more time into the mountains. And the messenger shows this tablet to the king, this recalcitrant <coughs> king of the mountains. The king of the mountains holds it to his ear, but there are no words coming out of the <laughs> piece of clay. Uh, so he's confused and somehow, but so impressed by the fact that this rival king knows how to put his words onto clay that he finally pledges allegiance. All right. So this is how these earliest scribes imagined how writing was invented. There's no reason to believe that that's actually how it happened. It was a much slower process. But there are nevertheless a couple of things that one can sort of extract from, from that story, from that story about the invention of writing. Uh, the first is that it's about power, because this is about projecting influence across space. And in fact, that's one of the earliest uses of writing. It, it had actually nothing to do with writing down stories that came later. The first uses of writing were to record economic transactions. This was the rise of cities. The, the, the city of Uruk wasn't any city in, the, in, in Mesopotamia. It was probably one of the earliest biggest cities in the world. And that led to a more complicated economy division of labor, which necessitated a, a, a way of recording transactions. And this is really how writing started. And then with a kind of uh, expansion geographic expansion where these city-states like Uruk were able to project their powers into the hinterland and up into the mountains. <coughs> and the second th thing one can deduce from the story is that it, it has nothing to do with literature, with storytelling happened orally, right? It was transmitted orally. Uh, and it continued to be the case for hundreds of years after the invention of writing by these accountants, if you will, but at some point, one of them or several of them decided to use this technology that was hitherto been used to really record economic transactions, to send diplomatic messages like the one in the story, and to record a longer story. Uh, and that's really the first longer text of literature. Uh, it's the Epic of Gilgamesh. It was written on these tablets a little larger than, than the one I showed you, but not much, again, sort of like a small tablet uh, today or like a big cell phone. Um, and that became an important story, the story of Gilgamesh. It became a kind of found, what I call a foundational text. Um, fragments of this text have been found all over the Near East, which shows that, that the, the city-states like Uruk and then the first territorial empire used these stories as a kind of soft power. Uh, projecting their influence. The, these stories, the Epic of Gilgamesh served as a kind of uh, a reference point for, for, an, for an entire region. So this, this is what happens then once you have writing these important stories, because it's very costly to write things down. It's a very specialized skill. So you, 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 you're gonna be very selective in what you write down. But so these important stories get turned into literature and they can be sent across space, and they remain reference points and can serve as soft power and sort of to, to create a sense of, of shared destiny and shared purpose. And this is clearly what happened to this very first text uh, in, in, world, in world literature. And the same thing happened in other early writing cultures, like in China, it was a, a poetry collection that was the first text that was written down. In Greece, of course, it was the, the Homeric epics. So you can look at these early writing cultures, Egypt is another one, and, and always you will find that, that early moment where, where, where an important story gets written down, 
and then dominates. It, it's sort of an early adopter of this technology, if you will, and, and, and acquires enormous power. So in a sense, this is the first stage in the, in, in the story of stories and, and how these early stories became so influential. It was partially because of the way they intersected with this important new technology of, of writing. And so uh, I call these early texts like the Epic of Gilgamesh or the Chinese poetry collection classic of songs or the Homeric epics foundational texts. Um, let me move on to uh, the next step in this history of storytelling. Um, and the, it takes place actually not that far from, from Uruk in southern uh, Iraq. We are now a little further, a little more to the north of Uruk. We are still in Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers, today's uh, uh, Iraq. And we are now in Babylon. It's very close, it's very central to this earliest writing culture that has emerged and that has produced texts like the Epic of Gilgamesh. But so we are now in Babylon among a group of Jewish exiles. Uh, this is after the first destruction of uh, Jerusalem and, and the temple. And a lot of inhabitants of Jerusalem have been forced into Babylonian exile. Uh, and some of them have become scribes, scribes, Mesopotamian scribes in the tradition of that scribal culture with which I began. One of them is called Ezra, and he's here imagined by in a medieval manuscript uh, to be sitting among this, his books. This is actually a anachronistic because really he was writing on scrolls, not on books. The book is a Roman in invention that came much later. But so Ezra the scribe is an imperial scribe uh, at Babylon, uh, but he has also started to write down or add to existing written stories of the Jewish people. What, what, what we now, you know, the, 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 the important books of the Bible. And at some point, Ezra and his fellow exiles ask the king of Mesopotamia whether they could return to Jerusalem and they're allowed to return. And so Ezra leads a whole group of Jewish exiles back to Jerusalem. They're shocked by what they see. Jerusalem has been, is barely inhabited. It has been destroyed. It's in ruins. And so they are starting to rebuild the city walls, rebuild the city of Jerusalem. But that's not enough because Ezra has brought this important text with him from Babylonian exile, from the center of the literary world, if you will, been inspired by that. And so he does something that's recorded in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. He builds a wooden platform, a theater. He calls all the people together and he steps out onto the platform and he holds up a scroll, a Torah scroll, where the stories that he and some fellow exiles have written in, while in exile and have brought back to Jerusalem. And he sort of requires, or the people react to this text almost as if it were a god. There's something sacred now about these stories. And this is an important step uh, in the history of literature. It's in some sense in this scene and other scenes, the scene encapsulates uh, that now some of these written texts are considered as sacred. So this is in some sense the beginning of scripture. Um, now, the fact that some texts are sacred is a, is a very familiar story to us. It's not a surprise. Uh, we all know that there are sacred texts, uh, different kinds of sacred texts, often associated with religion, but not only with religion. There are important political texts that have an almost sacred stack, uh, status. The Constitution of the United States is one. Um, but in this history, it's important that this idea had to be invented at some point, especially if you remember that writing was invented with a, in a very mundane setting for, by these uh, imperial accountants uh, who are recording economic transactions in, in Mesopotamia. So there's nothing in some sense natural that, that this technology would be associated with the sacred. But, but at some point it was, and, and in that scene, where Ezra, the scribe, returns to Jerusalem and, and, and holds up the Torah scrolls. 
uh, and, and people worship them, um, is one such moment. And, and I think it's, it, it's, it happened long ago, but it was an incredibly important moment in the history of human civilization, because as I mentioned, and as you all know, we still live in a world that's very much shaped by sacred stories, including, as I mentioned, the conflict uh, in the Middle East right now. So, so we are now really living in a, in a world uh, um, of, of this kind of scripture, uh, not just uh, uh, the Hebrew Bible, of course, the Christian Bible, the Quran. Uh, there's, in, in fact, today, it's, it's impossible to, I think for me at least, to think of any major religion that does not have a sacred text associated with it the Jains, Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, it's really all the major religions are text-based religions that, in a sense, that come out of a moment like this where writing, this accounting technology, intersects with stories, with special stories, and produces scripture. So in some sense, this is the, a second step, a second chapter in the story of, of literature when some of these foundational texts uh, that, that are being produced, but in different cultures, acquire the status uh, as, as scripture. Um, and I wanna rush on to the next chapter in the story, which in some way is, at least for me, the most surprising one. And it initially doesn't revolve around new kinds of texts, like the Hebrew Bible or the Epic of Gilgamesh, but it revolves around a group of teachers that emerged in most in different parts of the ancient world, more or less at the same time. Um, one of these teachers is the Buddha, uh, it's the first one probably, here depicted in a Tibetan uh, 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 tapestry surrounded by his students. Uh, another one of those teachers is Confucius, Master Kung, here depicted in a Japanese uh, multicolor print. Third is Socrates, as depicted by, in this famous painting by David. It's in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And the fourth is Jesus, uh, as depicted in, in uh, uh, this painting by Ghirlandaio, which is in the Sistine uh, Chapel in the Vatican City. Why do I mention these four teachers? because they are all, all four of them really foundational figures. They instituted some of the major forms of religion or philosophical thought uh, that still shape our world today. And as I said, they all lived in cultures shaped by these foundational texts. In the case of Jesus, it was the Hebrew Bible. In the case of Socrates, it was the Homeric epics, the earliest written texts in, in Greek culture. In the case of Buddha was the Vedic uh, tradition, the Vedic hymns that were so central to Indian civilization. And then the case of Confucius, it was that early poetry collection that I already mentioned that is sort of the foundational text of a Chinese civilization. And these, so these four teachers were shaped by these texts, but interestingly enough, they themselves didn't decide to write down their thoughts. In, instead, they, 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 they taught they taught their new philosophies or their, these new religious ideas that they, that they had. They, they presented them orally in a kind of back and forth in, in dialogues with their, with their students. Uh, in fact, some of them explicitly refused to write a single word. So we have these four figures, Confucius, the Buddha, Socrates, and Jesus, and they live in these writing cultures. Uh, but they decide not to write themselves. Uh, and in the case of Socrates, he's most explicit about it. He's, he even distrusts writing as a technology because he feels like once we rely on writing that it, uh, our memories would atrophy. Some of his worries about writing, by the way, echo our worries about the internet. He, he was worried about what we would call fake news because he said you can take a piece of writing out of context. And, and the author won't be there to correct if you are misunderstanding it. Uh, it's just there and it 
people can manipulate it. It's open to manipulation. So this is one of the reasons that Socrates put forward to why he rejected writing. And the other teachers, Jesus and uh, uh, Confucius uh, and the Buddha, they didn't say why they wouldn't write. But we can imagine that maybe they refused this new technology for, for similar reasons. In any case, they didn't. They developed their new ideas in dialogue with their followers and students. Sooner or later, of course, they died. Socrates and Jesus, a uh, violent death, uh, Confucius and Buddha of natural causes. But now their students were faced with a very difficult dilemma, namely, should they continue that oral tradition of their teachers? Some of, in the case of Socrates, had explicitly rejected writing, or should they write down their teachers that their teachers thought? Uh, and in the beginning, they continued this oral tradition, uh, but sooner or later, all of these students, uh, in some sense, betrayed their teachers. All students betray their teachers sooner or later. <laughs> and started to write down their thoughts. Uh, in the case of Socrates, it was his student Plato who did so. Uh, but it's interesting that Plato wrote in a new style, namely the philosophical dialogue, that, that retained something of that live back and forth that he had observed <laughs> in his teacher Socrates. And uh, the, the followers of Jesus did something similar uh, in the Gospels, we, which tell stories about Jesus, often revolving about around interactions between Jesus and his followers. Uh, only rarely are there actual sermons or longer speeches. The Sermon on the Mount is quite short. As you may, may know. And the same with uh, the, the Confucian Analects, are basically short anecdotes or scenes or conversations between Confucius uh, and his followers, and the same with Buddha and the Buddhist sutras. So, in some sense, out of that initial rejection of writing, and then the student's dilemma about not knowing what to do with and how to remember the words of their teachers, a new kind of text emerges uh, that, that, that is that's more lively, uh, that's more based on dialogue and interaction. Uh, um, in some sense, much easier to read than these early scribal texts. There are parts of the Hebrew Bible that is very hard to read, and I think of Gilgamesh as well, because now we, you have this sort of live dialogue or dramatic component. Uh, uh, Stuart mentioned, I have sort of one foot in drama and theater. And so I like the fact that there is something dramatic about these texts of the philosophical dialogues, Plato's dialogues, the Buddhist sutras, the Analects, uh, and the Gospels. So that's, there, there's a new kind of text that emerges out of that dynamic. Uh, uh, and, uh, and these texts, again, are some of the really important texts in human civilization because they you know, foundation of Western philosophy in the case of Socrates, of Indian philosophy slash religion. It's always a little hard to classify Buddhism. And Buddhism came to, to the West. It was seen as a religion. Uh, and in some ways it is, but in some ways it's also a, closer to a philosophical tradition. And in Confucius's case, it's clearly a philo different and an alternative philosophical tradition to the Western one. And in the case of Jesus, of course, it becomes it. It's not intended to, but in it ultimately becomes a new religion. OK, so we have these new types of texts. And, and how, do they, how do they fare? Um, how do they uh, fare in the, in the world shaped by writing? Uh, and I want to just spend a little bit of time with this text. This is one of the, uh, the Buddhist sutras I mentioned, the Diamond Sutra, records the Buddha's interaction with his students. Uh, this is a Chinese translation because Buddhism started in India and then moves to China thanks to traveling monks. Uh, and, and I have the history of Buddhism plays a big role, by the way, in, in my new book, uh, uh, book, Culture. So this is a really crucial text uh, for two reasons. It's a Chinese translation of a Buddhist sutra. But that's not why it's so important. It's important for two reasons, two technological reasons. Um, uh, the first is that it is written on paper, which is a Chinese invention and is a technology that would revolutionize the world of writing. Why? Because it's so cheap. It's much cheaper to make than silk. It's very durable. It's very thin and light to transport. And it's made out of pulp, tree pulp, 
uh, pulp of the mulberry tree initially, later it's made out of rags. So it's, it's a very cheap material uh, and it, it lowers the price of producing literature, makes it very portable, uh, and therefore creates in China a kind of a, a flourishing, a golden age of literature. It's interesting that the Buddhists were the early adopters of paper because they were very invested in proselytizing. In some sense, Buddhism was the first religion that really tried to actively win followers everywhere, which is why it moved so easily from one country, one Zan civilization to the next, from India to China. And so these Buddhist monks in China were excited when woodblock print came along. Very cumbersome, you had to carve an entire page, and then, but then you could produce you know, infinite, not quite infinite, but many, many copies of that page. So it only made sense for texts that had a wide audience uh, or texts that, that, that really, that, that had this kind of proselytizing uh, impulse behind it. And that was the case with, with Buddhists. So this Buddhist Sutra is the earliest surviving printed text in the world from, from, from 868. So many hundreds of years before Gutenberg reinvented print um, in, in Northern Europe. And that, so that's one way in which these new texts, including these Buddhist sutras, move. They move because of traveling monks, but they move because of these new writing technologies like paper and print that usher in the first age of mass, the mass reproduction of, of literature. Now it's interesting, these two technologies, writing and, and uh, print and paper go hand in hand because it's the, the, the power of print to, to create many copies, of course, is particularly strong if you have a cheap material in which you can print. So the, the two really went, paper was invented much earlier, but it, it was really paper that, that made print then so powerful. Which makes it interesting if we, uh, just for a moment, uh, follow the paths of these two technologies that both emerged in China. And at first, I want to just follow paper, which is perhaps the more surprising one, uh, because paper first spreads in the Chinese world, including Korea and, and Japan. But then the first culture to learn the secret of paper making is the rising Arabic world the rising Islamic world. There are even gruesome stories about a big battle and Chinese prisoners of war that somehow are made to relieve, to reveal the secret of paper making. There's no reason to believe that it was so violently extracted from, from, from China, but the, it, the, the anecdote shows that it was seen as a very powerful uh, technology in that uh, uh, something that you want to learn how to make. Um, and this is exactly what happened in the Arabic world. As in China, paper, the, the lower cost of literature, basically create, is the technology that powered the Islamic golden age of letters uh, and that led to wonderful calligraphic editions of the Quran, as in, as, in, as in this page that you see. But it also, because it lowered the cost of literature, allowed new kinds of stories to be written down for the first time, more popular stories. And the most well-known collection of these stories is one that you all know, namely The Thousand and One Nights. So more popular stories that could sort of clear the hurdle into print because the hurdle had dropped, had been lowered because of the lower costs afforded just by paper. So the Arabic world did not learn the, the technology of print. It was just paper. Uh, and it's interesting that paper then moved into Europe via the Arabic occupied part of Spain, Al Andalus. So it was really thanks to the Arabs that paper arrived in Europe uh, around the 11th century, just in time, if you will, for the other Chinese technology, namely print, to arrive in Northern Europe as well, a route that's a little harder to track, uh, probably a land route, the Silk Road, uh, and arrived in, in Europe. Uh, um, around the time of Gutenberg. Uh, so Gutenberg didn't invent print, but in some sense he put the two together, paper and print, and he also turned print into a kind of first assembly belt production process. So he's often seen as a kind of great inventor of print. It's, it's wrong. I think of him more as a kind of Steve Jobs kind of figure who, who uses 
an exist, you know, and a technology that's sort of around, but that people don't quite realize how powerful it can be, and turned it into um, uh, a, a sort of industrial scale production process. And one of the first texts he prints is another one of these texts uh, that emerges from the early days of literature, namely the, the Latin Bible, both the, the, the Old and the New Testament. Uh, um, it's the first big texts he prints. And so paper and print that had been sort of separated reconnect in, in Northern Europe and start the second uh, print revolution, this time in Europe. And you may be aware of this, uh, of course, much more than perhaps in the case of China. This leads to a kind of age of mass literacy. It, it as in the case of paper in the Arabic world, uh, some of the sacred texts are the early adopters of the new technology, as in the case of Gutenberg's printed Bible. But just as in the Arabic world, there were also more popular texts that could now sort of filter up into the world of print. The same thing happens in Europe and you have the rise of the novel, uh, a more popular literature that begins to circulate and you have that virtuous cycle of more texts being printed, readers, uh, more readers, more popular stories, readers wanting to learn how to read and write in order to read these stories and you have that virtuous cycle that finally leads to our age of mass literacy and, and mass literature. And so new kinds of stories emerge while old ones also get solidified and extend their reach. That's sort of the double story here that, that wherever a new technology emerges, the established canonized sacred texts are often the earliest ones that, that uh, uh, get, get multiplied in that way, like the Buddhist Sutra uh, or the Quran in the case of paper in the Arabic world or the Bible in the case of Europe, but soon that second more popular uh, 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 dynamic uh, uh, gets unleashed and you have more popular stories uh, uh, in, in the case of Europe, uh, 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 the novel, newspapers and, and, other, uh, and other products. And you know, as today with the internet, you have worries about that, uh, uh, about that explosion of literature that comes with print and paper. Uh, more is about authority. Uh, now it's no longer just the church that can control print. Uh, it can be sort of revolutionaries like Martin Luther. Uh, uh, it can be people like Benjamin Franklin who starts a newspaper. Uh, um, it's, it, 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 the old institutions of authority uh, lose some of that authority and new institutions like newspapers uh, and big publishing houses emerge. And I think something similar happens with our uh, uh, um, revolution with the internet uh, 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 because it's interesting that we've been living through one of these rare moments uh, where new technologies really change the way stories get produced, how they circulate, how they get read. And as in these earlier cases, also what kind of stories get, get produced. So in some sense, for me, looking at these earlier moments uh, is a way of understanding what's happening all around us. Uh, and so one of the takeaway points from that exercise is that you know, some of the worries we are having about, uh, about the internet and, and fake news and, 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 and all of that, they're not new. In some sense, they happened every time uh, a new technologies emerged all the way back in the ancient world. And there's one anecdote I sometimes talk about, which is uh, both Mesopotamian scribes and Egyptian scribes, uh, so you know, we're talking many thousands of years ago, having to go to scribal school. That's, that's the beginning of school, uh, scribal school. You have to learn how to read and write. And you've, you have um, anecdotes or, or you know, scribblings from, from some of these students that survive by chance. And some of them complain about their teachers who are too strict and who are hard on them. And then you have teachers who sound just like my colleague and sometimes me, myself, 
complaining these days. The young people, they don't really care about literature anymore. They just want to go outside and play. And then you have this, in, the, in this one Egyptian case, this teacher is, is lecturing them and saying, you know, if you really learn how to read and write, you can be indoors. You don't have to work in the fields. You, you'll be like an accountant. You'll, you know, you have a white collar job, essentially. Uh, if you just hang in there, if you work hard, I promise you a good life. So. Uh, so that, but that sense that you know the young people somehow that that they you know they they, they don't care about writing uh, or, or literature anymore sounds familiar. The other thing that sounds familiar from these earlier moments is the return of old writing formats. So I mentioned I started with the um, with the with the tablet. Uh, on which the Epic of Gilgamesh was written. And then I said that the tablet at some point was replaced by the scroll that, uh, that Ezra held up to be worshipped, the, the, the Torah scroll. And then at some point the scroll was replaced by the book, that Roman invention, like the one that Luther used to, um, to print the Bible. So these are three very different formats, these individual tablets, these continuous scrolls, like the, 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 the Buddhist scrolls or the Torah scrolls or the, the codex, the book, that you can sort of flip through. Well, it's been interesting to see that uh, in our own media revolution, some of these old formats have returned. For the first time in thousands of years, we have tablets. This is a Greek scribe sitting on his laptop, uh, 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 you know, looking exactly like he's working on, on his laptop. They're, I don't have an image, but they're, they're images of an Egyptian scribe sitting cross-legged, hunched over their tablets that also look very much like my students when, the, when there are no seats and they sit on the floor, they, you know, hunched over their laptop. So it's, and, and the scroll has returned because we are scrolling down our computer screens because computers have this kind of continuous text. We can simulate pages, but it's more natural in some sense to think of it as a, as a scroll. So some of these old technologies uh, that, shape, that have shaped stories um, have, have returned. Um, I want to leave you with one more anecdote. Um, and that is, I wanted to return to the place where I returned, began, and that's the city of Uruk in southern Iraq. Um, the city has long been abandoned, uh, and one of the reasons it was abandoned was of deforestation. And this is actually something that the Epic of Gilgamesh talks about. Uh, it's been fascinating to me to read the Epic of Gilgamesh, the first text written texts in, in world literature with an eye towards climate change. Because this is what the Epic of Gilgamesh talks about. Uh, this is the age of cities, the first cities that emerge in, in Mesopotamia, as I've mentioned. And cities are built out of clay and, and timber. So as these cities rise, uh, there's deforestation in Mesopotamia thousands of years ago. And one of the central episodes in the Epic of Gilgamesh is when the, when the king of the city, king of Uruk, uh, has to go all the way to Lebanon to fell trees and bring them back to build his city. So in some sense, there's, there's a kind of origin here of humans extracting resources from the environment. Uh, and the Epic of Gilgamesh thinks about it quite explicitly. And it's, of course, also the first place uh, that, uh, where the, the story of Noah and the flood uh, the, the earliest version of the story of Noah and the flood, the biblical flood, emerges in the Epic of Gilgamesh. So I've long been dying to go to Iraq to visit the city of Uruk, and about a year ago I finally managed to do that. It was very hard. Uh, the site is completely closed off and mostly unexcavated, and it's vast. This was a city that in, it housed about 50,000 people. It's a vast city. Uh, we had to get security and permissions from the minister. For those of you who are worried about my personal safety, I had two uh, helpers here by my side. But it was fascinating to work, to go there and to see how little has been excavated. And also, I ended up working with a group of environmental activists in Iraq who are, of course, interested in the Epic of Gilgamesh because it's their foundational text, and who are very interested in the way in which that, that story of Noah and the flood that starts in the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, and then, of course, is in the Hebrew Bible and also in the Quran, still shapes some of our 
uh, uh, environmental imagination, uh, and I think the kind of disaster scenarios about about the environment that's floating ar that are floating around in part come from these ancient texts. So this is something that I tried to capture in a in a recent small book about literature and climate change, um, and it's just one more example of the the shaping power. Of, of stories. So stories are, it's important to think about what kinds of stories we want to tell because stories matter. They, they shape the way we think about land and people and their histories, and, and including the environment. Uh, and that's why they have such shaping power over history. Thank you very much. It would be great to get a little bit of light so I can <laughs> see everybody. House lights. Does anyone know how to turn on the house lights? Perfect. Perfect. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. You earlier mentioned poetry. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that poetry is a good way to tell a story? And I'm thinking of, I have to say this, I'm thinking of one woman, if you know me, you know who this is, the lady who used to live here in the 1600s, right on this street, Ann Bradstreet, mm. she told the story of, upon the burning of our house, July 10th, 1666. So do you think that stories can be told by poetry? Absolutely. I mean, so you know, in the in the ancient world, uh, most stories were were you know epic poetry. They were they were you know they were they were not lyric poetry as we understand it. They were epic poetry, uh, and even when they were more shorter poems like hymns, they were sometimes collected in larger collections like the Chinese collection I mentioned that told small stories, but also overall as a collection sort of painted a picture. Of, of an entire civilization. Uh, in the case of China, it was a Chu dynasty that became sort of a golden age to which China would always look back that was sort of preserved in that poetry collection. And some of these poems are quite short and quite simple. Uh, and it was partly that simplicity that compelled people. But you're right, I've sort of emphasized storytelling. Uh, and so epic Poetry, though, is sort of a combination of stories, but I think the example you tell shows that even shorter poems that may not tell a grand story, but that may preserve a moment uh, uh, can be very, or, or just sort of meditate on one place, um, can, be, can, be ve can be very powerful. Yeah. What about a haiku? Yeah, uh, the haiku too. I mean, it's interesting that uh, haikus, uh, the entire tradition of Chinese and Japanese short poetry were often uh, embedded in longer stories. So in, in the book, I, I talk about the first novel in world literature, which is uh, a Japanese novel written by a lady in waiting uh, at the court of, uh, of Japan around the year 1000 uh, AD, The Tale of Genji. And, and she and other writers uh, of novels, so writing in prose, but she embedded uh, almost 800 poems uh, wow. into her, in her uh, novel. Why? Because this is how people actually communicated at court. So there's the sophisticated literary culture at court, and people constantly sent little poems back and forth. In, in a way, this was the main mode of, uh, and you had to be sort of clever in the way you responded. It mattered what kind of paper the poem was wrapped in. Uh, this was true in, with, in the realm of uh, romance, but also court affairs. So there, there, there is this entire court that was constantly sending these poems back and forth, uh, uh, basically discussing their affairs. And so this is one of the origins of the, of the haiku. So they, are, they, are, they, they weren't standing just by themselves. They were sort of embedded in these longer texts. Um, so yeah, it's a great, great question. Uh, yes, Mac. You did a wonderfully elegant summation, which has brought a number of questions to mind. One of which is why you mentioned, or omitted to mention, the literature of song. 
the literature of song. Yes. Um, it, could you want to say uh, more about it, or just? Yeah, I'm <laughs> okay, well, this, it, it's so that, that in a sense is the, it goes back to lyric poetry, you know, it comes from the lyre, uh, and, and there are uh, some of the, you know, some of the, originally, as I mentioned, all stories were transmitted orally, and so sometimes they were recited, uh, um, including the Homeric epics, you know, there's a, in the Odyssey, there's a scene where Odysseus himself tells the story of some of his adventures in response to a professional storyteller who tells the story accompanied by a by kind of lyre-like instrument. But there are also, there are poets like Sappho who uh, write shorter poets and who, who are also often depicted holding a lyre. So the, the, song, the, the connection between song and, and poetry uh, is, is absolute oral recitation uh, 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 of, of stories and, and, and singing, uh, off, and both can be accompanied by instruments. So you're absolutely right. Um, it's an it's, it's important source. Uh, and some of these longer texts that I mentioned, including, of course, the Hebrew Bible, contain, uh, uh, they're, they're all, as many of these older texts, most of the older texts are really sort of compilations. They're compilations of stories, of foundational stories about how the world were, was created, stories of people, but also songs, uh, uh, sometimes legal texts, uh, sometimes different kinds of texts, but songs, you know, the Song of Solomon uh, would be is the one that comes to mind right away, and hymns, the, in the case of the Epic of Gilgamesh, the earliest sources of this text were actually not long stories like the one that was written down finally, uh, but were hymns, uh, again, sort of shorter uh, song-like uh, texts directed at a deity often, uh, um, or a king. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, you've talked a lot about kind of the similarities and lessons and differences when stories arise or start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Are there similar lessons to be learned when there are important inflection points? I'm thinking natural things like when languages fall, like when you have to translate the Bible from Latin yes. to English. Yes. And sometimes yeah. there's conflict when you have yeah, to yeah. churches and things like that. Absolutely, no, it, and thank you so much. It's an excellent question. It, makes, it matters hugely. In fact, it's interesting to think about the Epic of Gilgamesh that way because the Epic of Gilgamesh was, was written in, in this first writing system I mentioned in cuneiform um, and therefore really dominated the whole region because it was also often these early, these foundational texts become the way in which people learn how to read and write. So the kind of writing culture in these texts often go hand in hand very closely. The same happened in Greece with the Homeric epics. Anyone who learned in Greece, learned how to read and write, learned it by studying uh, the Homeric texts. The problem with the Epic of Gilgamesh is that it was never transliterated, in, not even translated, but transliterated into another writing system. So when cuneiform fell out of use, it disappeared for, for 2,000 years. No one even knew that it existed. It was only because of a, a later king uh, who had obsessively collected the Epic of Gilgamesh on clay tablets that it survived. It survived because it was written on clay tablets in this library, this Ashurbanipal in today's Nineveh, near, in the middle of Mosul. Um, and so the library burned down. Um, and if the Epic of Gilgamesh had been written on that great Chinese invention paper, it would have just burned and would have disappeared. But it was written on clay. And what happens when to clay, when you expose it to fire, it hardens. And so this is how so the, these clay tablets were burned like in a kiln and you know, were covered in sand, but they survived for 2,000 years when in the 19th century, a kind of British adventurer started to dig around Nineveh and just uncovered them. So there the problem wasn't even translation, but transliteration. Uh, and it's interesting to see also in the case of translation, translation stories. So the translation of the Hebrew Bible into, Greece, into Greek, for example, happened in Alexandria because there is a you know, Jewish community there and they, they knew less and less Hebrew. So the, so, so the, the Bible was translated uh, uh, for, for that 
Jewish Greek speaking community in Alexandria and then later into Latin in its, in La, in, in its Latin form that, uh, that, that Gutenberg prints it uh, in, in Europe. So yeah, these translations, uh, in, in my new book, The Culture, I talk a lot about, it's much about how culture moves and circulates. And so central to that circulation are people that, that carry texts from one culture to the next, translate it from one culture to the next, transliterate it from one writing system to, to the next. Uh, and those, those have become sort of heroes for me. But there are struggles over it. Um, and and you know some there there are, there are worries because especially when you're dealing about with, with sacred texts there's a close connection between the original language and the original writing system and translations are sometimes seen as lesser. Um, this is true of the Quran when you when you encounter any translation of the Quran into a language that's not Arabic. It will, say, it will not say, a tr this is a translation of the Quran. It will say the meaning of the Quran because it's just the meaning. The Quran itself is in Arabic. Um, it's interesting that, that in, in, in Christian Europe, it was the Latin translation of the Bible that really dominated. It became the sacred text. So there, they were, weren't war. They had sort of forgotten that it had been written in Hebrew and Greek. Uh, and it was really it, that translation dominated uh, as a translation. So it's not always that people are fixated on, on, on the original. It can go both ways. But it, it, so there are lots of stories like that. Uh, um, and they're, they're really interesting moments of cultural change, of language change, uh, uh, and lots of debates. As you may know, when the, 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 the move from the Latin Bible to, to vernacular Bibles, to Bibles translated into English and, and, and other European vernacular uh, 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 traditions was very painful. It was outlawed. Some translators into English were, were executed for, uh, for translating the Latin Bible into English. Um, in the case of German, Martin Luther himself translated it into German. So that was his sort of revolutionary move to challenge the church. So yeah, lots of, lots of tension, lots of interesting things happening at these moments of translation. Yeah. Yes? Um, in, or I'm getting ahead a little bit because in culture you talk about how important the, if I recall correctly, how important the oral tradition was mm -hmm. um, because as long as you can continue to, to tell a story, you don't have to worry about translating. Um, and, and how do you think, so the question on that is how do you think, I don't think we have the ability to tell oral stories. We've, we've lost a lot of our ability to tell oral stories. And how does that, how do you think that impacts the ability to take stories forward? Yeah, no, it's true. And in a way, this is why Socrates rejected writing because he felt like, you know, we, we will lose something. Uh, if we if we commit ourselves to this new technology, and it's true, though you know when I when I started this book, the written world, and to some extent its successor, uh, culture, uh, I expected the story to go like this. Okay, so we've orality. Everyone lives in an oral world, and then we have the first written cultures: Mesopotamia, Greece, Egypt, China, and so on and so forth. And, and writing spreads, and then more and more people know how to read and write. And, and, and that, so as writing spreads, oral traditions somehow get diminished. Um, that, that, I think, was sort of the image I had in mind, that it was sort of a zero-sum game between orality and writing. And I've actually come to think that that's not quite the right picture. Uh, it's true, we have probably lost the ability to tell certain kinds of stories, to remember long stories. There are particular memory techniques that are necessary to remember a long text like a Homeric epic. And it's very, probably very hard to find someone who, who still knows how to do that. But at the same time, I've come to think of writing and oral traditions as a kind of connected system, if you will. Um, because it's still true that we, you know, it's true that we text a lot now. It's interesting that only now does is, has text become a verb, uh, and and the internet has, in some sense, supercharged the, the 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 importance of writing. But at the same time, this technology has also returned us to orality. Audiobooks are the 
fastest growing book segment in the book publishing world. You know, tick, you, you, I'm not sure how many TikTok users are here in this room. I'm not one, but you know, this is this is an oral medium where people record something and share it without. And sometimes they write something underneath. So it's it's interesting. And, and if you look back, every one of these moment, revolutionary moments in writing technologies changed the relation between oral storytelling and writing. Uh, but it's not always a one-way street. One example, the Arabian Nights, as I mentioned, they, they get written down, find their oral stories. They get written down and it gets cheap enough to do it, uh, uh, thanks to paper. But it doesn't mean that suddenly everyone starts to read the Arabian Nights. Of, often it was storytellers who sort of used the written form to remember stories and then they would continue these stories and, and add new stories to them. So there's, there's often a kind of dynamic relationship between orality and, and writing. And I think that continues even today on the internet. Uh, okay. But, yeah. No, oh, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Yes. And, and the story gets corrupted. Yes. It goes down the line. Yes. One, one comment of, of yes. how do you maintain the integrity. Yes. The second part of my, my comment or question is in today's society, there seems to be some um, interest in, in changing the texts that are written mm. in order to make them more palliative yes. to the current society. Yes. And so you're, you're changing. Yes. What was written, what was literature, yeah. and now you're you're corrupting it in the way that the yeah. telephone game did, sort of, except you're doing it uh, yes. because you feel like yes. I I I I agree. Uh, and and uh, I'm not a big fan of that. Uh, I think in part because I think that and this goes maybe to teaching of culture of history in general. I think that we shouldn't sanitize history. You know, we shouldn't we don't have to condone it. Uh, you know, past societies have very different values from ours uh, and the future will have very different values from us. But I think going back and sort of changing the record for these political reasons, I think is not a great idea and actually deprives us to grapple with the fact that the past was, was different. This is a big sort of uh, concern in, in, in this new book, Culture, where I sort of take some of our current sort of hot button issues, like worries about cultural appropriation is another one, the changing of, of, of history, and I, I mean, I don't preach it. I mean, it's not a political book, but I'm trying to show that how culture works and that you, uh, that, that you need to respect the past uh, uh, and not go in and, and change it. And, and, and you, know, you, can, you don't have to approve of everything. Uh, because it seems to me that that's also what we hope the future will do to us, you know. Um, exactly. and, yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, it is. It's funny the telephone game. The 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 when the New York Times reviewed my last book, Culture, they said, "Oh, the theory is it's a centuries long game of tele telephone game." And so, it, I think that's a, an appropriate. I hadn't thought of that, but uh, but I agree. It's a it's a it's a great idea. All right, one more question. There's a ten, oh, there. I'll, I'll keep it short. Uh, more people that, let me just. There are more people that had questions. I think there are two. Oh, come on. Are you okay? Is I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm good. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> thank, you there. For, thank you for your presentation, first. Yeah. And uh, as you've studied 5,000 years worth of these stories, ha have you observed anything over the course of that long history that what makes a good story? Mm. <laughs> You know, these stories are, there's an incredible variety of stories. I mean, that's the first thing you, you, I think, when you study world literature, you realize just the variety of stories. Um, but of course, there are some features that they have in common, and there, there are some people who have tried to reduce all stories to just one, the hero's journey, which became sort of a Bible in Hollywood. You know, sort of the hero begins, and there's an obstacle, and there's a helper, and then there's a new world, and a struggle, and, and the transformation. And so you can, you know, it's, it's an interesting 
game. It's I don't want to make slide of it. Uh, people have you know tried to reduce them all to one story or to five story types or to 35 stories. It's it depends always a little bit on what you want to what you're paying attention to. Um, but I would answer it like this: good stories, I think, often combine several elements. They they're set in a, in a setting, in a world. So there's a world building component of a story and that's important. And this is why some great stories, including the Hebrew Bible, starts with the creation of the world. Uh, um, I, I edit the Norton Anthology of World Literature and we just have a new edition come out and we, we start the anthology with all these world creation myths from around the world. It's fascinating to, they're sometimes similar, sometimes they're quite different. Uh, but so there's this world creation that's part of what good stories do. And then there's, you know, often an important protagonist or several protagonists and could be individuals, it can be groups, can be individuals that stand in for groups. Uh, um, it's, it's interesting how much stories reduce sort of the action or the agency sometimes to one or several players or, 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 or opponents. Um, I started to, in the context of climate change, worry a lot about that because I know that everyone knows that climate change is a sort of collective action problem. And there are very few stories about collective actions that, that, that are very effective. So this is something, for example, that worries me. Most of the compelling stories ha are more of the kind of the hero's journey. Uh, though there are interesting stories about collect gr groups or ensembles. Um, and then stories sort of have to figure out, yeah, have to figure out the scope of action. What can humans actually do? What are the limits uh, of action? And, and sort of uh, figure out what, what, what is possible and what's not possible. And so that I would say effective stories grapple with that as well. So these are quite general answers, but there is this incredible variety. Uh, but of course, whenever there's variety, you try to reduce or to look at, at types. Uh, and there are many ways of doing that. Uh, um, but that, that, that's the best answer I can give. There's another, or, or you. So a quick question. Um, throughout history, stories were always human generated. It was always sort of someone from another mm. story. Mm. And in today's world where AI is mm. starting to be able mm. to generate some type of story. Yes. Uh, yeah. How do you think the art of story writing will evolve? Is yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean both. Uh, I, I admit that actually for me, excite, I'm a little veer. I'm, I'm sort of an optimist, as you may be able to tell. So I, I, I veer more on the side of excitement because it is interesting to have a new sort of story generating uh, agent here uh, on uh, uh, on the scene. Of course, it's all feeding on human generated stories that are sort of repackaged. Uh, and you know, in 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 the in this book culture, it. I really emphasize the way in which cultures borrow from each other and, and you know, imitate each other. So I feel like I'm sort of compelled to say, well, if AI is doing that, uh, it's, not, it's not like humans always come up with these super original ideas and, and AI is the one that imitates it. No, 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 there's, there's something more complicated uh, 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 going on. Um, it, what's interesting, and, and the other thing I would say is, uh, it's actually closer to how some of the oldest stories were generated, where there aren't, or, there's no author for the Epic of Gilgamesh or for the Hebrew Bible or for the uh, uh, song uh, for the for the Chinese poetry collection classic of songs or for the you know for the Thousand and One Nights. Basically, all of the texts I've talked about, they, they have no author. They were compiled. They, they, they were cut and pasted. I mentioned how the story of the Noah and the flood originally comes from the Epic of Gilgamesh and then ends up in Genesis. So in, in some sense, uh, uh, you could say that AI is closer to these generations of compilers and editors and, and, and transcribers, uh, 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 just kind of mixing and matching and trying to weave it all into one coherent story than, than the author. Uh, the, the author who, sell, who comes up with an original story and, and sells that story, has copyright over that story and sells it on the marketplace. That's only been around in some sense for a couple of hundred years as a dominant figure. Uh, 
So yeah, so I'm not, I think yet again, a new technology in some sense grabs elements from an earlier mode of production and will be interesting uh, to see. You know, if next year AI has taken over the world, uh, you know, you can, uh, I'll have to admit that I was wrong. Um, there was one last one. Mm. Um, my question is a little relational to the last one. I was thinking, um, have you thought about what we can extract or learn from uh, of the history of storytelling in um, strategies to fight the disinformation that we live mm. today around fake news and yeah. stolen elections, etc. Like, is, is there anything if we look at the history of that storytelling yeah. that might inform yeah. ways that we can approach? That? Yeah. Now I have some thought about it. I don't have a great answer, but two thoughts, and one I already mentioned in passing, namely that this this fear about disinformation uh, happened before. It happened very clearly after the invention of print. Um, and it has to do with this change in institutions and authority. You know, who do you trust? Uh, and in the case of print, it, it took several hundred years for a kind of new system of authority and trust with newspapers uh, and, and universities and publishers and so on and so forth to emerge. The kind of stuff that was printed besides the Bible in the first few hundred years, I mean, it was so much worse than the stuff that's circulating on the internet. Uh, so it was wild, it was wild west because you know, no one was in control. Um, and so I think it, 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 it took time for new, for the system sort of to reach an equilibrium or to, uh, and I think we, we see that happening where we are trying to figure out is it social media companies that have to crack down more, what is their responsibility, what's, what's the responsibility of education that you have to teach in schools, how you, you know, trust uh, and what you can trust and what you can't trust. I was just for two, we two weeks ago in Portugal at a festival and it was interesting, there, there's a, a national sort of consortium that about literacy that was uh, uh, put together. And you know, we, we tend to think, worry about the young people. There they said that the biggest source of worry and an important spreader of fake news are actually old people who don't really understand the internet and believe everything that they read on because it's the, that's what we are all used to. You know, if it's printed, you know, you believe it. Uh, so so the, it's, it's actually, it, it's not just, the, you know, the young people on TikTok who, 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 who have a problem. So anyway, so the, I, I don't have a solution, uh, just a kind of historical perspective uh, that, that it will happen and I see, you know, movements uh, for it to happen, but how long it, you know, how long it will happen and, and how it will happen is, is, uh, is, is, another, is another question. Uh, so. Thank you, Martin. Well, thank you all. You can read his follow-up book, and I highly recommend it. Um, Kate is out in the lobby and has copies of it, and Martin would be happy to sign your copy that you can take home. So thank you again. For thank you all, and thank you for your questions. Thank you.